In today's day and age, you need to watch what you say. If not, you could be ruined by saying something certain intellectuals don't like. Like when the CEO of Mozilla was forced to resign over his donation to an anti-gay marriage campaign years ago. Or when Nanaimo City Hall canceled a conference because a friend of a friend said something about Chick-fil-A or whatever. I mean, the details didn't matter, right? The fancy people were mad. It's dangerous to stray from the liberal elite's party line. So let's take a closer look at this new political class. What is it? Who are they? And how is it using wealth and influence to bully people around the world? Professor Joel Kotkin is the author of a new article, Watch What You Say, The New Liberal Power Elite Won't Tolerate Dissent. He joins us now from Los Angeles. Professor Kotkin, welcome to the show. I think we just lived through a chapter of what you talked about where a group of politicians in Nanaimo City Hall, based on just some wisps and feelings, decided to cancel a convention that was sponsored several degrees of separation by Chick-fil-A. So they just ripped up a contract <laughs> at the city's convention center. Is that an example of how this liberal intellectual elite bullies and censors ideas they don't like? Well, it's one of the many examples that you see. I mean, the, of course, the worst offenders are universities, which is kind of ironic given that they were designed for free inquiry. Um, but even at my school, which is a, you know, which is certainly not a very liberal school, even there, you know, there's a similarity of opinion that's very strong. The administration hasn't allowed it to take over. But you see this in many, many schools. The administrators are so worried about not just, it's really not the students. When I went to Berkeley, you worried about the students. Where today, you worry about the faculty. Because mm. um, that's really where a lot of this is coming from. It's sort of a absolutism. And so uh, I sort of make the, the point that this is very much like the old first estate in, in uh, pre-revolutionary France. Decided what can you say, what can't you say, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. Mm. So even though they would hate the comparison with, with, the, with the original religious roots of clerisy, uh, they act very much the same way. Well, can we talk for a minute about what happened to Ian Hersey Alley at Brandeis University? I mean, this woman on paper is politically correct bulletproof Kevlar. I mean, she's a woman of color from Somalia, Muslim, a victim of violence and a forced marriage who now speaks about secularism and liberalism. I mean, you think she would be the apex of political correctness, and yet she was blacklisted from giving a speech at Brandeis named after a liberal Jewish uh, Supreme Court justice. How did that happen, and how does that uh, fit into your theory? Well, I think what you have now is you have a kind of canon of beliefs. And even in a place like Brandeis, which is a Jewish university, it's supposed to be very open, um, there are those who say, well, you can't criticize Muslims. Um, you know, and, and you would think that's kind of a little bit strange because you know, that means what, I can't criticize Christians, I can't criticize Jews. But no, you can criticize Christians, you can criticize Jews, but you can't really criticize Muslims. I mean, it is some sort of very strange phenomena that's taking place. And I call it, find it particularly ironic, given that many of the pe same people who will go after um, uh, someone for being, in quote, anti-Muslim, is somebody who would be horrified by the policies in most Muslim countries towards homosexuality, towards, uh, towards women's rights. Um, and yet somehow there's this disconnect. And I think it's really born of kind of this belief that anything that comes from Europe, anything that comes out of the traditional culture uh, that has evolved, let's say, here in North America, has to be bad, and something from a, in quote, developing country has to be good. Well, let me ask you this. We've talked about universities and academia, and, and you're a professor, and I've been to University of Fairbairn myself, but I think the real influencer of public opinion, what you can and can't say, a lot of it is the media, Hollywood, late night talk show hosts, the arbiters of cool. How have they become part of this restriction, this governance of what we're allowed to say and even think? Well, of course, there's some relationship now increasingly between the universities and the media to a large extent. But what this really is a, a, also a phenomena of geography. If you take a look at the media, and, and of course, you know, here we are in Hollywood, um, but also in places like New York, Toronto, um, 
there are concentrations of media in very, very liberal areas where, well, everybody feels this way. So, there, they, you know, whereas the opinions maybe that people have in Edmonton or Oklahoma City, in a funny way, almost don't exist at all. Mm -hmm. um, the reality that is portrayed in the New York Times, for instance, or I, I assume you might see this occasionally with the Globe and Mail, is so in contradiction to the, if not the opposite of what reality is, le leaves out all the various nuances about how things actually are. And so you get very, very uniform opinions. And what we've been seeing with media and also in academia is increasing sort of homogeneity of opinion. Mm -hmm. Still, there are some dissenters and there are some alternatives, but the vast majority of the media is very, very much on, on one track. Mm -hmm. you know, Jonathan Chait, the liberal columnist, made a very uh, good uh, point. He wrote a piece for the New York Magazine. He called the, the, um, the media the great left-wing conspiracy. Um, and there may be some truth to that. It reminds me of what Charles Murray said. He was on our show talking about these super postal codes, sort of self-selecting intellectual elites in Manhattan and in, in L.A., where you know people never actually interact with the other side of America. C can I ask you one last question? We're almost out of time, but I see this even in things that don't necessarily are, aren't necessarily political, but they're just sort of cultural. In Canada right now, we're having a large debate about resource industries. Can you build an oil sands mine? Can you build a pipeline? How about forestry? How about tanker ships? And I see that the parties of the left who used to love outdoors work, hard hat work, whose you know, very images of the hammer and the sickle were hard outdoors work, now the parties of the left are abandoning blue collar, white working, lower, lower middle class guys. And they're the party of the faculty lounge. So, the, our Socialist Party, the NDP, which would normally love to hang out with Teamsters and Foresters, now it's more the ecocentric groups, and it's sort of anti-development. I, I, that's my theory. I, does it, is that a, a cousin to your theory about the intellectual elites? that we, They're so insular that they no longer know where stuff comes from, where things are made. Well, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, I consider myself in many ways an old social democrat, and my idea is you, what you want is you want prosperity for the largest number of people. If you work hard, and, you, and you know, many of those jobs that you describe are very hard jobs. In many cases, they're union jobs. They pay reasonably well. Um, and th this is of no interest anymore to the current breed, if you will, of progressive or liberal um, compared to what the, it used to be. So what you fundamentally are seeing is a weird switch where the white, and not just white, but I think eventually, I think it will eventually extend to the Hispanic and even to some of the African American uh, working and middle class, is those people have been essentially abandoned by the left who think that their future lies with university professors, high end government officials, the media. And um, so you actually what you see is almost a reversal of what had been the base of social democratic parties and liberal parties around the world essentially being completely abandoned by, by those parties. It's amazing. Professor Cockin, what a pleasure to talk to you again today.